like to welcome everyone back after our, after our classes and our class time. It's good to see everyone. Appreciate everyone sticking around for this. And as Mark said earlier, we're going to continue our theme, uh, which is natural around the 4th of July, where we celebrate this nation's birthday and the freedom that we have in, in this nation and also the freedom that we have in Christ. I'd like to compliment Mark on a, a very good sermon this morning. He actually preached on my favorite chapter in the Bible, Romans 8. I love Romans 8 because it talks about our freedom. And the more we understand Romans 8 and the book of Romans, the better off we'll be in battling sin, and, and, in my opinion, and realizing where we are in relationship to what they had in the Old Testament and what they did not have in the Old Testament and what we have in our liberty in Christ. So we want to continue that theme, basically how God has blessed our nation. And what we'll be doing this morning, our first song will be led by Scott Phillips, Christ for the World We Sing. I have a scripture reading by Kevin Farley, the first Peter chapter two, verses 13 through 17. We'll have a prayer by Jerry Sells for our government, national, state, and local. We'll have a song by Mike Darnell, we're part of the family. We'll have a scripture reading by Jason Perry, Ephesians chapter 6, verses 1 through 13. Then we'll have a prayer by Jeff Jones. Uh, he'll be praying for the family, both physical and spiritual. And our devotional will be brought to us by Jim Kelly. Our invitation song will be led by Logan Chambers. And then Logan will have a closing song immediately after the invitation song. And then we'll all be dismissed. Thank you for coming. reading from 1 Peter 2, verses 13 through 17. Therefore, submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether to the king as supreme, or to governors, or to those who are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers, and for the praise of those who do good. For this is the will of God, that by doing good you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men as free, yet not using liberty as a cloak for vice, but as bondservants of God. Honor all people, love the brotherhood, fear God, and honor the king. Let us pray. Our Father, our God in heaven, the maker of our universe and all the good things we know that are in it. We come to praise thy name and glorify the things that you have done for us. Father, sometimes we say things or do things that are harmful and we ask you to forgive us, Father. Father, we pray that our government and our national level, President Trump and the Congress, may they work together, may they put political parties aside and work for the betterment of our country, Father. Father, we pray for our local leaders, 
and our state government father also, Governor Brevin, and uh, the people who are our representatives that work on the state level, we pray for them and may they do the things that you would have them do. May our country be led in the way that you have it be led. Also, we pray for our local leaders, Father, because it always starts at home. May we be with our governor. Uh, may we be with our mayor, uh, Rita Dotson, and be with the city council and also our judge executive, Kevin Neal, and also our commissioners, Father. May our local area continue growing. May it be the things, may we all do the things that we can do to help our government and help our country, Father. Put our own personal biases aside and do the betterment of our, our children that are coming after us. Father, we ask you to be with our children, our grandchildren, and those that have great-grandchildren. Bless them and watch over them. May they have a safe summer. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. We're part of the family that's been born again. Part of the family whose love knows no end. For Jesus has saved us and made us his own. Now we're part of
be reading Ephesians chapter 6, verses 1 through 13. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, that it may be well with you and you may live long on the earth. And you, fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. Servants, be obedient to those who are your masters according to the flesh, with fear and trembling in sincerity of heart as to Christ. Not with eye service as men pleasers, but as servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, with good will doing service as to the Lord and not to men. Knowing that whatever good anyone does, he will receive the same from the Lord, whether he is a slave or free. And you, masters, do the same things to them, giving up threatening, knowing that your own master also is in heaven, and there is no partiality with him. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Pray with me as we pray for our physical families and, of course, the spiritual family that meets here. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we are truly grateful and thankful that we can call you our Father and we can petition you in prayer. Father, we're thankful for our own physical families. We're thankful for everyone that represents our family. We pray, Father, that we will continue in love for one another. And we pray, Father, for each and every member, for their health, for their welfare, the mindset, the emotional aspects that we have, that all will be good in all things. Father, we pray that there are families that have trouble in relationships, whether it be husband, wife, children, parents. We pray that you will strengthen that bond at this time that we will grow stronger as children will grow stronger, parents as individuals, aunts, uncles, grandparents, that love will abound and not our selfishness. We pray that we will unite with each other and become strong as individual families that represent in this church Father, we know that sometimes in this broken world, sickness and disease come upon our family. We pray that you will heal those family members. You'll make them whole again. Father, we know you have the power and the ability to do that. We read about it in scripture. And we pray especially for our family members that have those problems occurring at this time. Father, we are so thankful for the design of your family. We know it's your design and it's the best design and we're so thankful for it. Father, more importantly, we pray for this spiritual family that meets here. The love that is shared for each and every member. We pray for our leaders as they lead this spiritual group here at Benton. Father, we know and understand that their role is very important and we pray for them, that you bless them and their family. Father, we know there's one standard, one authority and that's yours. 
Sometimes, Father, we're selfish, and we want to meet you on our, our terms. Father, help to put that away from us. Help us always to spiritually to meet you on your terms, by your authority, by your standard. And we know that this church will grow and will abound, and it will bring a light into this city, knowing that you are our God and Jesus is our Savior. Father, continue to be with this church, be with this family, be with our own physical families as we continue on in this year, as we express our freedom in this nation, and more importantly, express our freedom in Christ, who is our Savior. Please continue to bless us and forgive us where we fail. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. It's hot, it's humid, and your patience is waning. Directly in front of you is a family, and they're all speaking in broken English. So you put your head of courage on, and Dad, you ask the father, where are you from? And in his broken English, he says, Dubai. At this point, you would like to demonstrate your knowledge of world geography. So you simply ask, is that near Draftonville? <laughs> it's at that point your wife pulls you to the side and gives you a brief and in a current manner a history of geography. At that point also, <laughs> he asked you, the father, where are you from? And you bravely say, I am from the squeeze of Kentucky. With a puzzle on his face, he's wondering, He's asking, where is the squeeze of Kentucky? Also at that point, your wife pulls you to the side again and says, behave yourself. But you go on to explain that if you would look at a map of Kentucky, particularly down on the western end, you would see an area where it looks like God reached down and just squeezed that state. And brothers and sisters, we live in that squeeze, Benton, Marshall County, Kentucky. Now that everybody is conversing, the guy from Dubois asked the question, what is the greatest blessing in living in America? And you without reservation say freedom, freedom is our greatest blessing. In a book entitled God and Government by Dr. David Miller of Apologetic Press, he wrote this, every American ought to be grateful to live in a country where its founding fathers understood God's view of human government and consequently implemented that same view in their efforts to establish the Republic. One of those founding fathers was George Washington. Listen to his words. I now make it my earnest prayer that God 
would have you in his holy protection, that he would most graciously be pleased to dispose us all to do justice, to love mercy, and to demean ourselves with that charity, humility, and specific temperature of mind, which were the characteristics of the divine author of our blessed religion. And without an humble invitation of those exam of those of whose example in these things we can never hope to be a happy nation. Noah Webster, another one of our founding fathers, wrote, The Christian religion in its purity is the basis or rather the source of all genuine freedom in government. And I am persuaded that no civil government of a republican form can exist and be durable in which the principles of that religion has not a controlling influence. Yes, our founding fathers had a deep ingrained desire to establish a republic that was firmly grounded in biblical principles. As I read to you briefly, at least part of the Declaration of Independence, I want you to reflect for a moment on the biblical principles or concepts that are being presented. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed, that whoever or whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or to establish it and to institute new government, laying its foundation on such principles and organizing its powers in such form as to them shall seem most likely to affect their safety and happiness. If we don't like something about this country, we have the freedom to change it. Dr. Miller in his conclusion, it's as if rank and file Americans at the inception of the nation were widely educated in the principles of government and were attuned to the essentiality of government fulfilling its God-assigned responsibilities. The first 10 amendments to our U.S. Constitution are called the Bill of Rights. The freedom of religion, the freedom of speech, the freedom of press, the freedom of assembly, as we're enjoying right now, the freedom of petition. That all of those were the First Amendment. The Second Amendment deals with bearing arms, as we're quite familiar. The Third Amendment, no quartering. We don't have that so much an issue today, but in the time it was written, and when the British soldiers were there among the colonists, if they were on duty, the colonists had a responsibility to feed them and house them. And this amendment says you no longer have that responsibility. The Fourth Amendment, the right to be secure against unreasonable searches and seizures. Amendment 5, 6, 7, and 8 have the right or deal with the right of equal justice. And then the Ninth Amendment deals with the fact that we have a right to live and travel anywhere, to work at any job we qualify for, to marry and raise a family, 
to have a free and good public education and to join a political party, union, and other legal groups. And then our 10th Amendment, the right to transfer many powers of the federal government to the states. Think about those freedoms and those rights in the first 10 amendments to the U.S. Constitution. There are more, as you're aware, but we'll fo we just focused on, on that number. Freedom is not free. From about the time that the war began, the Revolutionary War, to this very hour, we've had almost 1.4 million Americans to die in war. Countless millions have been injured, maimed, and carried physical and emotional scars the rest of their life. Freedom is not free. Recently, a uh, survivor of Normandy was interviewed and he described what he saw when he stepped off of that landing craft. He said, before I even got off the craft, 21 of my fellow soldiers were killed. And when I stepped off that craft, I heard in the background the cries of dying men. Mama, 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 the dying of courageous men. Jesus on that cross cried as well, but he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Our greatest blessing in this life is to have the freedom that we can choose the religion that we believe is the one that we should have, the freedom to assemble, to express that religion, and to worship our God. But the most or the greatest freedom we have is the freedom from sin in Christ took care of that for us on the cross. He paid the price, the great price as well. Those men on, on D-Day paid a tremendous price, but Christ paid a great price when he died that our sins could be forgiven and that we could have eternal freedom in Jesus Christ and a hope of eternal life. Yes, our Lord gives us that great promise, and in Ephesians, the first chapter, verse 3. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love he predestined us to be adopted as his sons through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will to the praise of his glorious grace which he has freely given us in the one he loves. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding and he made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ, to be put in effect when the times have reached their fulfillment, to bring all things in heaven and on earth together under one head, even Christ. If you have not accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior this hour, or if you have, but you have needs that you want to bring to our attention, 
Remember that freedom is not free. It wasn't for our soldiers, and it's not for Christ who died for us. If we can help you in any way, come now as we stand and sing. When we walk with the Lord in the light. Thank you.